Last week, our pastor and his wife traveled to India to be with our missionaries, Ajay and Indu Law. The welcome they received was incredible. Pastor Barry spoke in the new youth center and spoke for the campus-wide chapel service. Ajay and our pastor presented vehicles and motorcycles to several pastors to help them in their work. They gave rice and blankets to over 250 widows. And they did the same for over 150 farmers and their families. They visited the Mission Hospital and dedicated the new Nursing College dormitory. They visited with and prayed for Ajay's mother. The CICM campus is an amazing story of God's grace and the generosity of God's people. Crossroads has played a major role in the CICM ministry. We provided the funds for a wing on the new Mission Hospital, provided funds for a huge youth center, which is being used every day of the week along with the Solomon Foundation, helped make possible the construction of the new nursing dormitory and providing the funds to purchase the land and build a building for Crossroads Christian Church of Jabalpur. Our pastor preached the message for the dedication of the new building. They've already outgrown the facility we helped build. God is doing a great work through Ajay and Indu Law and CICM, and we are honored to get to be a part of it. You know, if I'd been a better planner, I would have uh, not started this new sermon series today and just talked about India the whole hour. I'd love to talk about what they're doing over there and show you pictures of all the stuff. We had a great, uh, great experience. Uh, Janice loved going. Nobody got sick. It was wonderful. Um, it's amazing what they're doing at uh, CICM. Uh, they, th there are over one million people attending a church somewhere in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar, uh, the countries around them, over one million people going to church every weekend that was started by Ajay Law and CICM. It's astounding what they're doing. And, um, you know, our church, it's pretty amazing when you go back and you see all the things that Crossroads has made possible there. It's pretty overwhelming to realize that uh, we have been a major partner in helping that. And I, he, he, Ajay asked me to thank you for your generosity in helping them. Our elders uh, made a decision this past Thursday to do a couple of things uh, to help them. Uh, number one, the, the World Conventions being held in Delhi, India in 2017. And Ajay asked me if I would come back and be the closing speaker. Sunday morning, there'll be thousands of people there. It's the World Convention. And uh, so our, our uh, elders approved giving $10,000 to them to help cover the expenses for that uh, convention. And then uh, because the church that we started, Jabalpur, uh, in Jabalpur, Crossroads Christian Church, when, when we drove up, and there's huge signs, and they even used our logo, which is kind of funny. And uh, all these people, were there. they've already outgrown this facility. So uh, our elders approved sending them $4,000 a month uh, beginning immediately to help them to expand that church and reach more people for Christ. So it's an amazing story. And um, <clears throat> they're reaching tons of people for Jesus Christ, and they're able to do that because of the, of the generosity of churches like Crossroads. I'd love to talk about that today. I'd love to talk about Superstart here on Friday and Saturday. This place was full of teenagers. I came in yesterday afternoon and just watched part of the worship service. What an amazing thing to watch those. Those kids sing different than adults do. I mean, it's like with their whole heart. And, uh, you know, if you think sometimes the sound in here is a little uh, high, uh, just don't come to the youth events because... Uh, it's off the chart. But what an amazing thing to have all those kids here. And I want to say thanks to all of our youth staff and all the volunteers who helped to make Superstart such an incredible event. It was tremendous. It was tremendous. 
Or I could talk about uh, Night to Shine. Who knew that when we built the children's building that we were building the perfect venue for a Night to Shine experience? But over 1,000 people, over 200 uh, special needs, uh, children, teenagers, uh, uh, adults who came to have an incredible night. And uh, what an incredible experience. I want to thank Lindley Cameron, Michelle Gibson, all of their team, all of the volunteers, all the buddies, all the people. It was an incredible experience. I am so glad that uh, on our Night to Shine, we did. So would you thank those people for that uh, as well? But since we're starting a new five-part series, I can't talk about any of that. So take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 15. I want to read a couple of verses in just a moment. We're starting a brand new five-part series on the core values of Crossroads. They say, why is this important? Because if we don't know what's at the core of everything we do, we'll get off track. And by the way, I want you to know that when we're done with this series, every single one of you will be able to recite, remember, and share all five core values. I guarantee you that. So, well, Pastor, I'm not not very good with memory and all that. Don't worry about it. I guarantee you every single one of you is going to be able to say, hey, listen, these are the five core values of my church. This is why we do what we do. This is the driving force behind all we do. And we're starting with number one this morning. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word? Romans chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. Paul writes, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's prayer is that believers would live in such harmony. Did you know there's amazing things that can happen when, when, when there's unity among God's people? There, there's amazing things that happen when, when a team gets on the same side of the ball. Amazing things can happen when, when you get together in accordance with Jesus Christ. But, but the whole point of it is, is so that we can glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated, and may God add His blessing to the reading of His Word. In November 2013, the Oxford English Dictionary announced selfie as the word of the year. Now, you and I are living in in a culture, in a society, completely absorbed and obsessed with itself. Not long ago, Fortune Magazine asked the question, quote, what happens when advances in mobile technology catch up with the human ego? Hmm... Let's see, end quote. The article went on to say, what do President Obama, Ellen DeGeneres, and Pope Francis have in common? They've all taken selfies. Now, if you've taken a selfie, if you've snapped a selfie, it doesn't mean you're a narcissist or you're on your way to hell. I want to be very clear about that. But I also want to be very clear about the fact that our world has its priorities wrong. I wasn't able to watch the Super Bowl. We were over in India. They said if we wanted to get up at 5.30 in the morning or 6 a.m., we could catch the whole game. And I wasn't interested in that, although I did check the scores a couple of times and saw that the Denver Broncos beat the, the, the Carolina Panthers. But I saw something else that most people missed or chose to ignore. Did you hear what Peyton Manning said immediately after winning Super Bowl 50? He was being interviewed by an interviewer named Tracy. This is what he said, quote, You know, I'll take some time to reflect, he said. I've got a couple of priorities. First, I want to kiss my wife and kids. I want to hug my family. I'm going to drink a lot of Budweiser tonight, Tracy. I promise you that. I'm going to take care of those things first. Then I'm going to say a little prayer and thank the man upstairs for this opportunity, end quote. What's wrong with what he said? Besides the fact... (laughs) I feel like I'm at a Donald Trump rally. (laughs) Get him out of here. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. That was not a political statement. I'm sorry. But besides the fact that he said he was going to drink a lot of Budweiser and referred to God as the man upstairs, what's wrong with what he said? God was last on the list. Now, I'm not picking on Peyton Manning. What he said just illustrates the point. 
Most people in our world have God way down the list, if not last. In fact, even those who claim to know and love God, God is way down the list. Now, glorifying yourself is not new. It's not a cultural phenomenon. Glorifying yourself is a devilish deception. It is a subtle, satanic substitute for the real thing. And our world is intoxicated with it. That's why the number one core value here at Crossroads is glorifying God. Not us. God. Everyone is living for something or someone, either self or success or money or sex or or job or drugs or alcohol. Everyone's living for something. What are you living for? David said in Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me. And in the very next verse, he says, therefore, my heart is glad. You see, living for the glory of God is the way to joy. Living for ourselves is the way to disappointment and disillusionment. God created us to live for His glory, and when we do that, He gives us great joy. Colossians 1.16 says, all things were made by Him and for Him. And for the most part, creation agrees with that. Creation glorifies God. Psalm 19.1 tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. There's never been a falling out of the stars. There's never been a, a revolt by the host of heavens. Isaiah 43, 20 tells us even the animals glorify God. The animals. Flowers don't either. They just flower. Butterflies, they, well, they, they butterfly. All of creation glorifies God. Out of the entire creation of the universe, there's only two that have rebelled. You know who that is? Angels and men. Now, God's already taken care of the rebelling angels. Men are the issue today. Now, the Bible begins with the glory of God in the Garden of Eden. It ends with the glory of God filling the earth and the entire universe for for all eternity. Adam and Eve enjoyed rich fellowship with God and every blessing you could think of when they were glorifying God. But then something happened. Their problems began when they stopped living for the glory of God and started living for themselves. What do we want to do? What do we want to try? What do we want to experience? Ephesians chapter 3 verse 21 says, to him be glory in the church. If there's one place where where God ought to receive glory, it's the church. You know, Adam and Eve messed up because they they started doing things their way. They started listening to the devil who is pictured for us as a snake, a serpent, which should be a good visual picture. You know, we were over in India, they had some um, cobras, and they had, a, they had a snake charmer. They brought him out there just for us. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, you know, he was way back over here, and, and he had four snakes, and he would hit them on the top of the head, and they'd come up, and they'd look right at him, and then he'd kind of twist his fist, and they wouldn't strike him. They never struck him. Now, you hit me on top of the head, there's going to be a response. I just, just so you know, okay? But we had all these snakes, and he's playing his little thing, and these snakes are dancing and all that. And Ozzy said, let's go over, Brother Barry, and have a picture. I said, no, let's don't say we did. (laughs) You go ahead. The devil is pictured as a snake to stay away. They listened to him. And what was true for them is true for you and me. Every problem we face is a problem that happened because someone stopped living for the glory of God. God has made everything to glorify Him. And if something or someone does not glorify Him, there are are serious consequences. You fall under God's judgment. If we choose not to glorify God, the price is extremely high. I'll give you two quick examples. Nebuchadnezzar from the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 4, we meet this king. He was a great king in the Babylonian Empire. His basic problem was he was an egomaniac. It was all about him. Now, he was a brilliant guy, great, great military leader. He conquered Egypt, all the other nations of the world. He was brilliant in the learning of the Chaldeans, which was the highest echelon of learning among the Babylonians. He was a phenomenal architect. He's the one who designed the hanging gardens of Babylon and and the adjacent palace. And and what most people don't know is he invented air conditioning. So how did he do that? He had an aqueduct that brought water down from the hills into these... uh, channels, and then he had foliage over the top. And when that water would come and and overflow on the foliage, it would drip down. And when the air came through, it cooled the building. He invented air conditioning. He was a brilliant guy, a smart guy. 
But over in Daniel chapter 4, you can almost hear all of heaven start to rattle as Nebuchadnezzar speaks. Listen to what he says, Daniel 4, verse 29. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, which he designed and built. And the king answered and said, Is is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? You know, in Isaiah 42, verse 8, God says, My glory I will not give to another. And it didn't take long at all. In the very next verse, listen to what happened. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you, you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time, that seven years, shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives to whom he will. Immediately the word of the Lord was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men. He ate grass like an ox. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew long as eagles. Feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. Seven years. All because he he took the glory that belonged to God. Now there's good news. In verse 34 it says, At the end of the days... I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is his own personal testimony, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me. He said, I was out of my mind when I was trying to take God's glory for myself. But when I came back to my senses, I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. And he goes on and on and talks about the Most High and how great He is. You know, if you get to go to heaven, you're going to get to meet Nebuchadnezzar. And I want to tell you something. When you walk up to him and say, hey, Nebi, what was that like when you weren't glorifying God? He's not going to say a word about it. You know why? Because he got it now, and he's going to say to you, listen, let's just talk about how great God is. Let's just just glorify God. Don't talk about me. I've done nothing. He won't talk to you about all of his accomplishments and all of his achievements because he finally figured it out the hard way. There's a New Testament example over in uh, Acts chapter 12. We meet another king. This time it is King Herod, and he had a king-sized ego as well. And there were some problems going on around in the surrounding areas, and so he decided to have a, a Herod Appreciation Day. Now, for you to fully comprehend that, you need to understand, he, he was the one that came up with the idea for Herod Appreciation Day. By the way, did I tell you his name's Herod? And he's the one that planned it. He told all these people, we're going to have this day where we're just going to get everybody together, and they're going to talk about how great I am and how wonderful I am. It's, it's this incredible day. So on Herod Day, he put on his royal robes, he sat on his royal throne, and he delivered a royal speech. Everything was going great. And then the people responded, and they said, this is the voice of a God, not a man. He loved it. He said, now these are some smart people right here. And you know what the Bible says? Verse 23, the story ends this way. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. He died. Because he didn't give God glory. Isaiah 42, 8, my glory I will not give to another, God says. By the way, there's a footnote, verse 24. It says, but the word of God increased and multiplied. You see, God has to get the glory hogs out of the way so so that his kingdom can grow. And friend, I just want to say to you, don't be a glory hog. The the consequences are horrible. In fact, don't even be a glory mosquito. You know, just every once in a while, nobody can see you, nobody knows you're there, and you just take a little glory. Don't do it. Don't do it. Well, if we're supposed to glorify God, that's why we were put on this earth. And if not glorifying God brings serious consequences, then we need to know how to do it, and we need to be focusing on doing it all the time. Warren Wiersbe said, and I quote, the first step down for any church is taken when it surrenders its high opinion of God, end quote. What does it mean to have a high opinion of God? It means we respect Him. It means we revere Him. It means we recognize Him as Almighty God. It means we understand that He's not just the man upstairs, but He's God Almighty. You know, you read Isaiah 40. I wish I had time to read it this morning, verses 12 to 31. You get a pretty good picture of how great God is. Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. 
Now, now the truth is, most people in our world have no fear of God. That's, that explains why they do so many dumb things. They have no fear of God. They have no idea who they're messing with. Proverbs 9 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Listen, life won't begin to make sense for any of us until we understand the one who gave us life in the first place. And listen, when any politician or, or some leader stands up and says, Now, we, we don't need God in the public sector, you are listening to an absolute fool. We need God everywhere. We're here, we're put on this earth to glorify Him. But you know, even even some churches have gotten it wrong, and even some pastors have gotten it wrong because they preach and teach a gospel. They have churches that tell people, it's all about you and making you feel good and making you successful. And their churches are packed. I mean, is it surprising to you that it would be standing room only where you get to hear what you want to hear? Warren Wiersbe continues, he said, and I quote, the pop gospel of success tries to make us believe that God's greatest concern is to make us happy, not to make us holy. And that he is more concerned about the physical and the material than he is the moral and the spiritual. The success God is a celestial errand boy whose only responsibility is to respond to our every call and make sure that we are enjoying life, end quote. And it's all wrong. We were put on this earth to glorify God, not ourselves. It's not about us. Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2 says, Everything in this world and everyone on this ball called the earth belongs to God. I hate to make an announcement to you this morning, but you don't have anything. So, Pastor, you don't know me. (laughs) I don't have to know you. I know you don't have anything, and I don't either. The clothes that we're wearing today, these aren't ours. The cars in the parking lot, those are not ours. The homes we think we have, those are not ours. Yeah, I know First National Bank owns it. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about nothing we have belongs to us. It's all God's, and He gives it to us for just a few years here on this earth. I don't know if you know this or not. I know you don't remember it, but those who gave you birth will tell you that you came into this world with nothing in your hands. And guess what? That's the way you're living in this world. You're leaving this world with nothing in your hands. It doesn't belong to us. It's all God's. And the sooner we recognize that and the sooner we acknowledge that, that God, I know this is all yours and I want to glorify you with whatever you give me for whatever years I have, that's when life begins to make sense. But some people will come along and say, well, I don't need God. I don't want God. I don't need God. Really? You're breathing God's air you're living on God's earth, you're drinking God's water, you're eating God's food, you're enjoying God's resources, you're being kept alive, kept alive by God's Son. God provided the gas in your car. The roof over your head, by the way, came from God's trees. The food in your stomach came from God's animals. The life in your own body came from God's own breath. Even the things that man invents come about because God provides all the materials. Even the brains men have to harness and develop the technology for those resources all come from God. And you say you don't need God? Colossians 1.16 says, all things were made by him and for him. You realize this morning, if everything you and I have was suddenly removed from us that had nothing to do with God, we would have nothing. It all comes from him. So why wouldn't we live for his glory? Why wouldn't we realize, wow, I, I need to be living for him. I need to glorify him in everything I do. You ever wonder what that looks like? Well, first of all, if we decide we're going to glorify God, not ourselves, it would, it would change the way we worship. You know, when you and I get the correct view of God, it will absolutely revolutionize our worship. Psalm 111, verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all those who practice it have good understanding. His praise endures forever. You know what that verse means? It means that when you and I live to glorify God, He'll fill us with wisdom and understanding, and we'll know that He alone is worthy of our praise and our worship. We'll understand that. Psalm 147, verse 1 says, Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, how pleasant and fitting to praise Him. You know, when you praise anyone or anything else, it doesn't fit, it doesn't work. You know, you'll, you'll watch concerts on, on television, or maybe you go to them and you'll watch all these people who are worshiping whatever those singers or performers are on the earth, and that's a false promise. 
They don't deserve glory. They don't deserve honor. And if they take the honor or the glory for themselves, you better get as far away from them as you can. Now, only one deserves our praise and our glory. That's God. And by the way, you realize that if God never did another thing for any of us, we'd still need to worship Him for all eternity? When we decide to glorify God and not ourselves, it will change the way we worship. It will change the way we walk. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Reverence for God. That'll change your behavior. When you start saying, how will this glorify God? It'll change what you do. Before I say this, I want to make sure, how will this glorify God? Before I do this, I I, I really want to make sure, how's this going to glorify God? Before I go to this place, I want to make sure, how's this going to glorify God? If you would get those words out there in front, you'd change about half of what you're already doing. Changes how we walk. Remember in Genesis 39, verse 9, Potiphar's wife tried to seduce Joseph, and Joseph said to her, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against my God? Do you know what kept him away from immorality? His desire to glorify God. Do you know what puts you in immorality? Is your desire to glorify yourself. And there are consequences. All sin is merely an expression of disrespect for God and His Word. We essentially make ourselves God. Well, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to go where I want to go, say what I want to say, do what I want to do. It's all about me. Wrong. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You remember the wedding in, in Cana of Galilee? We got to drive by that place a couple times. We went over the Holy Land. It's not much today. In fact, they, they're not even sure if it's its exact spot, but they do know it's the area. But the story in John's gospel, it, it's the only time, you, you, you know, Mary, the mother of the Lord, she doesn't say a whole lot in Scripture, but in this one place she does speak. And you know what she says to the servants who were there at that wedding? Do you remember that story when Jesus changed the water into wine? You remember all that? Mary said, whatever my son says, do it. Whatever Jesus tells you to do it, do it. That's still good advice. In fact, that's great counsel. Whatever Jesus says to do, do it. It will change the way we worship. It will change the way we walk. It will change how we work. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You know we've only got one job. Fear God, keep His commandments. That's it. That's our only job. That's our whole duty. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 24. Jeremiah says, They do not say in their hearts, Let us fear the Lord our God, who gives the rain in its season, the autumn rain and the spring rain, and keeps for us the weeks appointed for the harvest. He was talking about the people of his time who were, they, they didn't pay any attention to God. They, 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 they acted like God had nothing to do with anything. And, and the reality is, they're nuts. They're insane, like Nebuchadnezzar. God is the one who makes things work. And the sooner you figure this out, the better life's going to be. In the natural realm, it is the supernatural hand of God that makes things work. He's behind it all, folks. You know, I'm, I'm convinced sometimes the, the famines that we experience, the droughts that we experience, the, 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 the evil things that happen in our world are nothing more than God says, you want to live without me? Here you go. And he just steps back. He just steps back. Friend, we don't need him to step back. We need him to step in. We we don't need him out of public life and private life. We need him involved in every area of our lives because we we were put here to glorify him. There's a fourth thing. When we decide to glorify God, it'll change how we wait. Isaiah chapter 40, begin reading verses 12 to 31. It's all about how great God is and includes concludes with these words. And but they that wait upon the Lord. And you know the verse, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with, with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. What are we waiting for? Titus 2.13 says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We glorify God here on this earth in everything we do, and we're waiting, and we're waiting for Jesus to return, and we're waiting with anticipation because we're doing what we ought to do. 
Friend, if you're messing around at home when you're a kid growing up and, 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 and you're tearing the house up and having a party you shouldn't have and doing things you shouldn't do and, and your parents, suddenly you get a phone call, hey, we're about five minutes away. You know, you flip into panic mode. What am I going to do? Because you were doing the wrong stuff. But you know, if you're doing the right stuff, if you were straightening things up, if you were cleaning out the garage for your dad and doing some things for your mom and all that, and they call on the phone, you go, great, I'll be waiting for you. I can't wait till you get here. It's the same principle. Same principle. Second Peter 3.10 tells us that one day God's going to destroy it. This earth with fire. He's going to burn it all up. He's going to burn all the stuff that you hold dear and you love to see and, and, and say, this is awesome. Like, like Nebuchadnezzar, look at all this stuff I built. It's all going up in smoke. All the stuff that God's given us, all the stuff that we, it's going up in smoke. It's going to, going to, going to be destroyed. And Revelation 21.1 says God's going to replace it with a new heaven and a new earth. And 2 Corinthians 5.10 says we're all going to stand before him in judgment, not for sin, but for the lives we've lived here on earth. It's a judgment for rewards. Did we build with wood, hay, and stubble, straw, the things that burn up, or did we build with gold and silver and precious stones, the things that are purified by fire? just reveals how real they were. You know, most people, they don't live like that. They live like wood, hay, and straw. They're, they're living for the moment. They're not living with eternity in view. They're not thinking about the life to come. And friend, I want to tell you something. You pass 50 years of age, you're on, you're on now, you're on the fast track. I mean, you, you, in those early years, you think, man, this class will never be over. This, I'll never be done. I mean, it just takes forever. And then you pass 50, and all of a sudden now, man, you're on a speed train. Better wake up. Better, better stop living for the moment. You know, people say, well, you know, I, you know, I want to enjoy life, and I want to, and so they live for the moment, and they don't think about eternity, and they're costing themselves big time. There's a fifth thing. If we decide to glorify God, not only will it change the way we worship and how we walk and how we work and how we wait, it will, it will change how we witness. You see, just the simple fact of understanding who God is and what he's going to do, we have to witness to our friends and family members. We have to tell them. To not do that would be the tragedy of all tragedies. When you and I could have prevented an eternity spent without God in a place like hell, when we don't do anything about it, that's beyond tragic. It's inconceivable. 2 Corinthians 5.11, Paul said, Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. Some people say, well, you know, what you believe doesn't matter. But what you believe does matter, and who you trust does matter. They say, well, it doesn't matter what religion you follow. We're all going to the same place. That's not what God says. Isaiah 46, 9 says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. You see, if people live for themselves and they don't glorify God, they'll spend eternity in the wrong place, hell. We need to glorify God. We need to revere Him. We need to respect Him for who He is. We need to honor Him and worship Him. We need to give Him the place He deserves in our lives, every day of our lives. I like what A.W. Tozer said. He said, and I quote, with the goodness of God to desire our highest welfare, the wisdom of God to plan it, and the power of God to achieve it, what do we lack? Surely we are the most favored of all creatures, end quote. And that's true. Of all the creatures God ever created, men and women, boys and girls, are his prized possession. He wants to say to all of creation, all of the universe, look here, look here, look here. This is my best. This is my best. But what happens when we're not living for his glory? What happens when we're living for ourselves? What happens when we put ourselves or our, our own stuff ahead of him? Kind of affects that, doesn't it? Friend, I want to challenge you. Glorifying God will make a difference, not only in this world, but in the world to come. And that's why it's the number one core value here at Crossroads. Glorify God. If you don't do anything else, do that. You'll be fine. 
Glorify God. But you know what? If you start with glorifying God, you'll do everything else you need to be doing. And we'll talk about that in the weeks to come. Let's pray.